Hello and welcome. I'm Don Renfrew and for about the next hour or so I'm going to be speaking to you about spine pain. I'm a radiologist uh, from the Radiology Associates of the Fox Valley. We are a private practice radiology group of over 30 radiologists and we cover nine separate hospitals in the state of Wisconsin. Most of my work I do here at Door County Memorial Hospital, which is located in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. I'm a general practice radiologist and one of the things that I do is uh, run grand rounds for the hospital. In, in that capacity, we frequently give talks to uh, general practitioners, including uh, such primary care providers as family physicians, internal medicine physicians, emergency room physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants. As giving these uh, lectures uh, evolved, um, or giving these conferences uh, evolved, I found that many times the um, uh, primary care providers needed some basic information on what to order for patients with different uh, symptoms. And therefore, I made a series of lectures. This is one of those lectures on uh, what to order for different circumstances. Before working at Door County Memorial Hospital, I was also in a couple different academic places, including the University of Iowa and Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's. I also worked for a private practice, uh, a private enterprise company called Center for Diagnostic Imaging. And while I was there, I did nothing but uh, cross-sectional imaging of the spine and diagnostic and therapeutic injections of the spine. And that allowed me to spend a lot of time and effort and energy concentrating on that particular uh, set of patients. and. Uh, uh, therefore, I'm going to kind of bring some of that expertise here to this particular lecture as well. Now, who is this lecture for? Uh, well, as noted on this slide about primary care practitioners, fewer um, U.S. medical school graduates are choosing to go into family medicine. Uh, because of that, much of primary care practice is probably going to be performed by physicians' assistants and nurse practitioners as time goes on. This lecture is really for anyone who orders imaging studies who, who does primary care. So it includes nurse practitioners and physicians' assistants, but also family medicine physicians and internal medicine physicians and emergency medicine uh, physicians. So it's a kind of a broad audience, but basically anybody that has an interest in patient management and is in the position to order studies uh, probably could benefit from this uh, lecture. Other people that might benefit from the lecture would be people that took care of patients with back pain. Chiropractors might be interested in this lecture, and uh, nurses and other people who, who also, even if they don't order studies, who also uh, take care of patients with back pain might be interested. All right. Uh, now, at, at, as of this time, back pain uh, remains difficult to diagnose and treat. Um, according to Wikipedia, uh, back pain is one of humanity's most frequent, frequent complaints. And in the, uh, uh, in the United States, acute back pain, also called lumbago, is the fifth most common reason for all physician vi uh, visits. About 9 out of 10 adults experience back pain at some point in their life, and 5 out of 10 working adults have back pain every year. So there's a lot of people out there with back pain. Um, now, simply because a problem's common doesn't mean it's easy to handle. Indeed, caring for back pain patients can be a source of great difficulty for several reasons. And these include the fact that most of the time patients with back pain, particularly with axial back pain, are diagnosed with what's called degenerative disease. And there seems to be little to offer between doing nothing or oral medication at one extreme and multi-level spine fusion surgery at the other. In addition, there are a few, a few patients who have a serious uh, underlying medical condition, and these won't benefit by conservative measures, and they need prompt diagnosis and specialized treatment. So, at the same time, um, you care for uh, patient, uh, patients with back pain. You're listening to this lecture because uh, you care for these patients in two senses of the word. You see, you see the patients in your clinic, and you want them to improve. You want to offer state-of-the-art care, and you certainly don't want to miss any medically critical diagnoses. Um, and by the way, while all the slides read back pain, or, and most of the time we'll be talking about back pain, note that many of these patients may also have accompanying leg pain, or even predominantly leg pain, which may either be radicular pain from irritation of either a nerve root or a spinal segmental nerve, or it could be somatic referred pain, that is, it's pain received, uh, perceived to be coming from the leg, but actually coming from uh, for example, a sacroiliac joint or a facet joint. In addition, the main points I'll be making today about back pain 
can also be extrapolated with very little difficulty the topic of neck and arm pain. And I will specifically talk about those a little bit toward the end. Now, knowing what and when to order to evaluate back pain can be tough. Um, you want to offer state-of-the-art care, and at the same time, there's a wide variety of possible diagnostic tests and therapeutic options available in the management of back pain patients. In diagnostic imaging alone, you have plain films, CT, myelography, combined myelography with CT, nuclear medicine bone scans, and MR imaging. Uh, therapy ranges from doing nothing through oral medications and physical rehabilitation, spine injections, surgery, and then sometimes surgery again. Uh, you face the challenge of appropriately picking one or more from this ever-expanding list. So you might start out with a lumbar spine series and decide, no, that you really need a myelogram, but maybe that's outdated. Maybe you need a CT scan instead, or at the end of the day, what is it that you order? Um, at the same time as all this, you want to order the right study the first time every time. Uh, you want to see your patients get better. You don't want to see them disabled or out of work, um, and you don't want to waste medical resources. So. Uh, what, am I gonna, uh, what am I going to tell you today? I'm going to review three key concepts to help you know what to order and when to order it. All right. The three concepts uh, are, uh, first, red flags in the patient's presentation call for priority imaging. Second, MR has supplanted pretty much all other modalities for imaging workup and back pain. And third, injections may provide diagnostic or therapeutic benefit for patients with back and leg pain. So point number one, red flags call for priority imaging. Uh, Gordon Waddle, who's a Glasgow spine surgeon, uses the term red flag to denote those clinical findings that indicate the potential of uh, medically serious uh, diagnosis. And these should prompt priority imaging. Waddle's book is called The Back Pain Revolution, and it's an excellent read, and I would uh, recommend it for anyone that's interested in those patients with back pain. Um, now, to back up for just a minute, in general, back pain is such a common disorder and so often runs a benign course that the common advice, even though it may not be very often followed, is to wait four to six weeks before pursuing any costly diagnostic measures. Um, however, in the presence of a red flag, it's prudent to expedite imaging. Uh, that doesn't mean that you need to do the image in the next five minutes, imaging in the next five minutes, but it's probably better to get it done uh, today or at least this week rather than waiting for another month or so. Um, red flags include a personal history of malignancy, unremitting pain, pediatric patients with back pain, and patients with constitutional symptoms like weight loss and fever. So let's take a look at a couple of those. A history of cancer may indicate metastatic tumor as the cause. Unfortunately, the, person's, uh, the patient's personal history of cancer is often somewhat less conspicuous than what's indicated on the clipboard here. It may have been several years since the diagnosis and treatment of cancer before it returns to manifest as a new onset of back pain. This is particularly true of breast cancer, which may be apparently cured or latent for years or even decades and then returned into metastatic form later in life. Um, now, this particular scenario with patients presenting to a primary care physician with back pain after successful cancer therapy is likely to increase in the years to come as oncologists become better at curing uh, or at least putting into remission various types of tumors. Um, in the case of a patient with new onset back pain and cancer, it makes most sense to first review any existing imaging studies. Uh, imaging studies, particularly recent studies, uh, may indicate even in retrospect a malignant cause of their pain. Studies done for tumor imaging like CT of the abdomen and pelvis may show bone destructive changes, which are easy to overlook if the interpreting radiologist is not specifically keyed into the back pain symptoms. Nuclear medicine studies like bone scans and PET CT studies usually show more conspicuous, uh, usually show the tumors more conspicuously, and uh, uh, it's pretty easy to appreciate the abnormalities on those studies. So let's take a look at a few cases. Here's a 63 year old man with lung cancer and back pain, and his MR shows fairly conspicuous lesions T1 weighted image on the left, T2 weighted image on the right, and you see the matched abnormal signal at a couple of different vertical levels. Uh, this image has arrows at the abnormal levels, and this man had lung, no lung cancer, developed back pain, and had metastatic deposit. Here's a 78-year-old with prostate cancer and back pain. The image on the left is done uh, before, uh, is, I'm sorry, is a T1-weighted image, and the image on the right is a T2-weighted image. Oh, back up just a little bit. 
this 78-year-old had images done a few years before. Those are the pictures on the left, and the pictures on the right are T1 weighted images, and you can see new metastatic deposits in several locations in the spine. Uh, he had degenerative, uh, I'm sorry, he had lytic spondylolisthesis of uh, that lowest level marked with the arrow on this slide, and then he developed multiple METs in the interval between those two exams, and he had new onset of back pain. So again, these are two patients with known uh, cancer with new onset of back pain, and they both ended up having uh, malignancy. Now, uh, unremitting back pain is also a red flag, and it may indicate tumor, osteomyelitis, or fracture. Uh, this red flag emphasizes that typically benign, uh, benign back pain tends to be mechanical in the sense that it's brought on by mechanical factors, like assuming a certain position or bearing a certain load. Whereas back pain secondary to such factors as tumor, osteomyelitis, or fractures is not mechanical. The, pain, the patient frequently can't find comfort either standing or sitting or lying down, and he finds it difficult to find relief with medications which would normally offer at least some benefit to those with mechanical back pain. Uh, now note that while young healthy adults would not normally uh, sustain a spine fracture without significant trauma, the amount of trauma necessary to fracture an elderly osteoporotic spine can be so trivial that it escapes notice and the patient may present with an osteoporotic fracture uh, and may not even recall a specific incident uh, if they have uh, uh, decreased bone mineral density. This 75-year-old man came in with unremitting pain, and again, this is a red flag. The guy could not be comfortable in any of a number of positions, and indeed, the physician notes uh, stated in this case, over the last two nights, he has been awake with pain over the anterior right thigh uh, going as distal as the knee, but not beyond. The patient denied any exacerbation of the pain when walking. As a matter of fact, the pain is better when he moves about. That's certainly not mechanical pain. And this guy had uh, uh, an obvious tumor, and he has a uh, neural compression. He did not have any known primary. Uh, so this is kind of an unusual situation. Um, and at this point, he got a, a workup to determine whether it was obvious what the primary was in this apparent metastatic disease. Um, here's a T2-weighted image with an arrow indicating the lesion coming out of the back of the vertebral body and into the spinal canal. Um, here he is with an axial image on our left with a T1-weighted uh, Axial image showing tumor filling most of the canal and the neural foramina, particularly on the left side. Um, and the image on the right there is a CT scan with a uh, biopsy needle in the neural foramen. Here I put an arrow on the tumor and also on the biopsy needle. And I actually biopsied this lesion and it ended up being a lymphoma, a very unusual case. But here's a guy who had unremitting pain, non-mechanical pain, ended up having a tumor as the cause of it. Here's a 75-year-old who was morbidly obese and he had bilateral lower extremity edema. He had a, uh, experienced low back pain and back spasm and he came to the emergency room. Uh, the plain film was obtained. Um, very difficult to make too much out of the plain film. It looked like his um, aorta uh, was displaced a little bit from his spine by soft tissues here. Um, he was actually so large that he wouldn't fit in the MR scanner, so a CT was done. The CT scan here, actually through the sacrum, showed a tumor at the location of that arrow. Uh, the displacement of the vessels is probably normal tortuosity of uh, the uh, aorta. Here, uh, on slide 46, I've got arrows on the left and right neural foramina, and you'll note that uh, that the neural foramina on the left side is no longer present. And that corresponds to the destruction of the, that portion of the sacrum by this tumor. And this patient ended up having metastatic cancer to that location as the cause of this pain. This 73-year-old man had back pain after a lifting injury, and although the plain film didn't really show too much, the MR showed abnormal signal through the superior aspect of the vertebral body, here marked with an arrow. 
And you can see on the T2-weighted stir image on the left side, you can see increased signal intensity. On the T1-weighted image on the right side, you see decreased signal intensity. And uh, this is often called bone marrow edema. Uh, pathologists tell us it's not actually edema, but fibrovascular tissue. Uh, but it, at any rate, it causes abnormal signal in the marrow. And it's usually the consequence of tumor, I'm sorry, usually the consequence of fracture in situations like this, but it can be the consequence of tumor. It's not a specific finding. Um, in this particular case, there are features that help you sort out whether an uh, abnormal signal is more likely tumor versus fracture. Um, if there's normal marrow signal in the vertebra, if it's of a linear character, if it spares the pedicles, if there's no associated soft tissue mass, these are all findings that would favor a benign post-traumatic cause of that abnormal signal in the marrow. If you have marrow at multiple abnormality, or marrow at multiple levels, it's abnormal, uh, or associated with soft tissue abnormality, then you have to start thinking in terms of a tumor. All right, what are other red flags? Another red flag is a pediatric patient. Pediatric patients shouldn't really have back pain. Uh, children rarely have so-called degenerative changes that cause back ache. Sometimes teenagers will have central low back pain from spondylolysis, but any younger child really needs a careful evaluation. Now here's a two-view uh, chest slash abdomen study in a patient who had lower back pain um, I was fatigued and fussy over a two-week period. Of course, for a two-year-old, it's going to be hard to get any detailed history. Uh, basically, if you look closely at this image, there's an abnormal soft tissue density up in the upper chest. Uh, on the frontal exam, some of that density may be in the right chest, although sometimes thymus can, the thymus can look pretty prominent, too. Uh, on the MR study, uh, the exam through the lower spine looked very good, but through the upper spine, there was a tumor at the edge of the field, and this child ended up having uh, uh, neuroblastoma. So children with tumor have to be careful with those. So that's point number one, and that is the red flags call for priority imaging. What's point number two? Point number two is that MR supplanted pretty much all other imaging methods uh, for back pain. Now, of course, a lot of your algorithms will call for use of plain films prior to MR imaging, and uh, it's probably not all that of an unreasonable thing to do, um, but I'll tell you what, you know, if, if it's negative, you often end up getting the MR because it's not going to show you things like disc herniations and synovial cysts and other causes of significant back pain that's going to miss a lot of tumor. So it doesn't really help a lot to have a negative plenty film. Uh, if it's positive, usually it's not specific enough. Sometimes if it's a simple fracture, it's specific enough. But a lot of times the imaging findings are not specific enough. If they show destruction of the vertebra, for example, you're usually going to get an MR anyway in order to figure out whether there's neural progression. So plain films, even though it sounds like a good idea to start with a cheap, readily available exam, they usually don't help as much as you might like them to. Um, MR, on the other hand, is phenomenally helpful. It is interesting, really, to note that in the space of about 25 years, MR has really revolutionized medicine. MR has changed the way neurologists and neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons evaluate and care for patients um, in both pre- and post-operative anatomy, which is uh, amazing information available on these scans. Um, the two guys that developed MR, Lauterberg and Mansfield, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, it's great academic research tool, but also a great pragmatic tool for taking care of uh, everyday clinical patients. It would be hard to find anybody in the U.S. that hasn't had a family member undergo MR, really. Uh, and uh, we all are quite familiar with this. Sports announcer saying that the patient or the, uh, the player will get back in as soon as he gets his MR cleared. Um, so, MR demonstrates not only the red flags we just talked about, but it also shows bony and soft tissue abnormalities uh, as a cause of pain. So MR can show you the uh, red flags. We'll go over that first. So we noted previously, uh, talking about red flags, that patients with a history of cancer, like and those with unremitting pain, and pediatric patients may have serious medical diseases. Uh, MR is the method of choice to evaluate these patients. It's worth noting that many, while many of the patients with tumor and fracture and infection do demonstrate red flags, Clinically, there are a lot of these patients who don't demonstrate red flags, and MR will help sort all that out for you. Um, here, for example, is an 80-year-old woman, right buttock and calf pain, no red flag, but the arrow here shows a tumor in her spinal canal that is the cause of her symptoms. 
On this image, uh, which is number 65 on the left picture, you have a sagittal T2-weighted image, and you can vaguely see that tumor uh, sort of displacing CSF. On the image on the right, what you're seeing is the dots or the nerve roots seen in cross-section, and they're, per uh, they're arranged peripherally around the tumor, which is occupying the central part of the spinal canal. This image, uh, with a little different technique, shows that tumor somewhat better in the central portion of the spinal canal. And uh, this patient ended up having a uh, meningioma as the cause of her symptoms. This 84-year-old had pain after spending some time on Christmas decorating. The plain film didn't show too much. If you blow it up and look closely at the superior margin of the disc in the middle of the exam, it's a little bit fuzzy. Here I've got an arrow on it. Uh, the MR at the same time showed marked abnormal signal within the disc and of the two vertebra adjacent to the disc. Um, and these findings are really quite characteristic of an infection. Spine infections have various terms associated with them, and the best of which is probably infectious spondylitis. Uh, that indicates the infectious nature of the process and indicates that the spine, including both bone and soft tissue, may be involved. Osteomyelitis implies a bone infection. That's certainly the case here, but the term doesn't really indicate the soft tissue component of the disease. Conversely, the scitis tells you the disc is infected, but it doesn't tell you about the osseous component. Finally, epidural abscess and paraspinal soft tissue infection may arise in this situation. And these sometimes have disastrous consequences. Um, with a little further review of this guy's chart, it was evident that in addition to doing the Christmas decorating, he'd had a, a transurethral resection of the prostate or TERP and bladder stone removal about a month prior. And this uh, setting is actually pretty common in, uh, as far as you know, elderly men that develop infectious spondylitis, um, they will often have had uh, manipulation of the genitourinary system and seed the discs or the spine with bacteria after such procedures. Um, and again, slide 72 here shows uh, abnormality of the vertebral bodies and of the intervertebral disc space. Now, MR will also show symptom producing in benign soft tissue abnormalities as well as malignant soft tissue abnormalities. MR superior, superiority as an imaging method uh, comes predominantly from its ability to visualize soft tissues. Uh, prior to MR imaging, imaging relied on the use of x-rays either to produce plain films or myograms or it relied on CT scans. And while a wonderful invention and tremendously useful, X-ray based techniques like X-ray, plain films, and CT, they have limitations. One of the main ones of these is that the X-ray attenuation of different tissues like the intervertebral disc, muscle, synovium, even tumor, is virtually identical. And the X-ray attenuation of fluid within the cerebrospinal spaces is not really much different. That means that neuroradiologists relied for decades on secondary phenomena to diagnose spine disease. You, you had a loss of intervertebral disc space on a plain film implying perhaps possible disc herniation or degeneration. You had a filling defect on myelography or myelo, myelo CT. And with MR, each of these separate tissues is not only individually identified, but it's strikingly conspicuous, particularly when combining the features of the T1 and T2 weighted images. These evaluate different characteristics of the patient's protons, and they create pictures offering anatomic detail and beautiful demonstration of the disease processes. So um, what are the kinds of soft tissue abnormalities and, and processes, benign processes that cause symptoms that you'll see with MR? Well, MR is going to show you disc herniations. Now, the original description of disc herniation was uh, uh, the, the major first one cited in most literatures by Mixter and Barr in 1934. Um, since then, of course, herniated discs have gotten a lot of press. The North American Spine Society, it's also called NAS, originally proposed and various other medical societies have adopted a specific nomenclature that distinguishes subtypes of herniation. If you view it axially, the normal intervertebral disc is, is like a tree trunk with concentrically arranged uh, layers of oblique fibers that are kind of interlocked like this and, and uh, those constitute the annulus fibrosus. Then in the middle is the nucleus pulposus 
and that's got the consistency of, of toothpaste, at least uh, until it dries out. Now, if, the, if those annular fibers degenerate and, and or tear, nuclear material in the middle can kind of extend through uh, or beyond the fibers of the annulus. This usually it happens posteriorly, and when it does, it can either compress or inflame the adjacent nerves. Uh, now, the mass terminology calls small discreations by and large protrusions, and it also has to do with their external contour and whether they exceed where the disc is up and down, how wide, how tall they all are, and so forth. But ba basically, smaller disc herniations or protrusions, they're much less likely to be symptomatic. Uh, mass terminology calls the larger disc herniations extrusions, they're much more likely to be symptomatic. Even large disc herniations, some would say particularly large disc herniations, uh, are likely to throw, show remission through time probably because what you're seeing there is not necessarily entirely that nuclear material, but also uh, fibrovascular reactive tissue or even hemorrhage. So, uh, MR does show disc herniations. This is a 59-year-old woman who developed right buttock pain that radiated down the posterior aspect of her thigh all the way to her heel, typical of S1 radicular pain. And you can clearly see why. The arrows are showing us the uh, herniated disc here, and on this image, number 81, on the left side, there's another arrow which shows you the displaced traversing S1 nerve root with the disc herniated uh, herniation material in front of it, displacing it posteriorly. Um, note that uh, disc herniations can cause pain usually only if there's associated inflammation. And some authors think that the pain created by disc herniations is predominantly or entirely chemical or inflammatory. Um, if you take a nerve and compress it, you typically don't get much in the way of pain. You do get paresthesias, numbness, tingling, or whatever. And you can kind of do this experiment yourself. You already probably have when you're falling asleep on your older nerve and wake up and your fingers feel funny. You can figure out what your older disc older nerve distribution is by knowing which, you know, by noting which fingers are numb or not working quite right. But the, the point being is that they usually don't hurt so much as just feel funny. Um, same way with neural compression of uh, uh, spinal nerve roots in the spinal canal or spinal segmental uh, nerves outside the spine. Um, compression alone usually causes uh, paresthesias or numbness or tingling, things like that, rather than pain. The one exception to that is uh, nerve root compression of the dorsal ganglia in the neural foramen. Pressure alone there can cause pain. Also, pressure associated with inflammation can cause pain. Um, because of this whole inflammation versus pressure issue, some people think that the real way to treat disc herniations is with anti-inflammatory medicines, including injected steroid, rather than surgical resection of the disc uh, itself. Of course, if you have Neurologic, progressive neurologic symptoms like foot drop, that's a sign that there's severe pressure. And if you have uh, imaging features of compression and clinical features of compression, then you probably do need surgery. Um, otherwise, at least a trial of more conservative therapy is usually advised uh, prior to proceeding directly with surgery for herniated discs. Now, in addition to disc herniations, MR shows spinal stenosis. Here's an 82-year-old who had left sciatic pain, and you can see some pretty severe narrowing of the spinal canal on both the sagittal T2-weighted MR and the axial uh, T2-weighted MR, where the spinal canal is quite narrow at this point. The plate film shows some spondylolisthesis, uh, but you can really appreciate that it's a, a bit difficult to grade that stenosis or to know whether there's any associated neural compression. The arrow shows you the, uh, a bit of narrowing there. Um, now, spinal stenosis refers to narrowing of the passageways through which the nerve roots and the spinal segmental nerves travel. And the term includes the uh, narrowing of the spinal canal, the subarticular recess, and the neural foramen. While your plain films can show degenerative changes in patients with spinal stenosis, and, and while CT can often better show the degree of narrowing of the passageways, MR is capable of showing not only the narrowing but also demonstrating the neural structures and any associated compression directly. It shows that compression directly. Compression of the nerves may result in back pain and radiculopathy, but also results in a less specific generalized weakness and disability. 
and that finding may be exacerbated during the extension and relieved during flexion. Uh, indeed, patients often find relief of symptoms when they're at the grocery store, uh, for they use a grocery cart as an ambulation assistant and drape over it, uh, releasing their, uh, the, the compression on their neural tissue in the lumbar spine, and that allows them to, uh, to feel a bit better. So patients with spinal stenosis or symptoms of spinal stenosis, you might ask them if they feel better when they're at the grocery store, and if they report yes, it's usually because they're draped over a, a cart. Here on image 86, we show a blue arrow with a normal caliber spinal canal above the arrow, uh, area of significant narrowing, and the white arrow shows where there's some degenerate spinal anesthesis and spinal canal narrowing down to the point where the traversing nerves are quite compressed. Here's an axial picture through that same level, and you can see the so-called trefoil, a little triangle shape of the central spinal canal, or this, I'm sorry, the spinal canal there is uh, quite constricted because of a combination of bony and soft tissue uh, together. These three arrows kind of delineate the central uh, or the, uh, the, the spinal canal and how narrow it is at this point. Um, another soft tissue abnormality that MR can demonstrate is the synovial cyst. Uh, There's a three-joint complex at each level of the lumbar spine, in addition to the intervertebral disc in the front, which is, doesn't have a lot of motion to it in most cases, and it's kind of a fused cartilaginous type joint in the front. There, there's two, there are two facet joints in the back, and these are true synovial joints, like your finger joints or elbow joints. Um, these joints are prone to the same sorts of degenerative processes as other synovial joints, and those include cartilage loss, synovial proliferation, and then secondary osteophytic spur formation. Uh, the synovial proliferation can occur posteriorly off of the back of the joint, in which case it really doesn't uh, cause any neurologic symptoms, it may just cause some pain. Unfortunately, the proliferation and cyst formation can also occur anteriorly, and in that case it can compress the nerve roots in the spinal canal or, or the dorsal root ganglia in the neural foramen. The cyst can account for up to about 10% of patients that present with particular pain. Uh, clinically, these patients really are hard to distinguish from uh, patients with disc herniations. Uh, now, this is a 65-year-old man who suffered from back pain for some time, uh, but he developed some new symptoms of, of his right leg with right leg numbness and right foot drop. The MR study shows a large lesion filling much of the right side of the spinal canal at the L4 level, and this is a pretty sizable uh, synovial cyst causing neural compression. Um, so those are synovial cysts. MR can show symptom producing benign bone abnormalities as well. Uh, we already kind of went over the red flags and the people with tumors in their bones as a cause of back pain. Uh, uh, and this is, uh, I'm going to speak here about some of the benign bony causes. Now, MR is outstanding in the diagnosis of soft tissue abnormality, which you'd think because it's a soft tissue imaging technique. It's a, it may be a little surprising to hear that MR is also outstanding in the evaluation of most of the, most of the bone abnormalities in the spine. And this follows from the fact that while an x-ray can show cortical bone discontinuity and displaced bone fragments in the case of a fracture, it's really relatively insensitive to abnormalities of marrow. Uh, in fact, most of bone consists of bone marrow, trabecular bone, and the, and, the, and the soft tissue between the trabeculae. So MR doesn't show you the trabeculae as well as CT, but it does show that all that tissue in there. And whether there's post-traumatic fibrovascular tissue or hemorrhage or tumor or infection, MR is going to show you all those things. Uh, direct visualization of the marrow also makes MR, um, uh, allows MR to diagnose, uh, uh, to make diagnoses that are difficult and impossible, uh, or impossible with other imaging methods. Um, so, MR can show you post-traumatic fractures that are not seen on plain film. This is a 39-year-old man who was working on a scaffold, and he fell about 20 feet and he landed on his feet. Now, of course, he's a younger, healthier guy, so, uh, you know, he didn't have a huge blowout or terrible uh, fracture, but he did have severe pain. Plain film's taken at the time of the uh, fracture, or, I'm sorry, the time of the injury in the emergency room really didn't show too much. Uh, he came back three or four days later, still having a lot of back pain. On the MR, you see abnormal marrow signal on the T1-weighted image 
noted on the arrows here. And then uh, here on slide 98, you see the sagittal stir image showing increased signal in the vertebra, as well as the sagittal T1 weighted image showing increased uh, signal in the vertebra. So the point here is that the fractures through marrow invariably result in fibrovascular tissue and hemorrhage. Non-displaced but painful structures may be impossible to see on plain films, or I'm sorry, non-displaced but painful fractures can be impossible to see on plain films even when you know exactly where the fracture is. At the same time, MR, through its superior soft tissue visualization, offers a specific diagnosis of fracture and bone contusion or fracture, and it evaluates any associated spinal canal compromise and also excludes disc herniations. In addition, MR can show stress fractures uh, seen on plain films. This is a 73-year-old patient who had new pain with a change in her exercise routine. The patient described the pain as worse with ambulation and relieved with sitting. Uh, the patient had undergone a knee prosthesis and was also known to have spinal stenosis. The family physician suspected that the pain might be coming from the hip or the lumbar spine. Uh, he consulted an orthopedic surgeon who thought the problem was likely spinal stenosis and an inflamed nerve or nerves uh, and because of a uh, change in the exercise program. An, an MR was ordered. The lowest cuts on the MR study showed admirable signal in the sacral ala, bilaterally much more pronounced on the uh, right, on the patient's right. So this slide shows an arrow pointing to that admirable signal on the lowest most cut on the spinal MR showing admirable marrow signal. Now the patient went ahead and got a CT scan, and on that CT scan, which you see here, there's cortical offset. Here's an arrow with that cortical offset. So, so she has a stress fracture of the sacrum developing secondary to her altered stress uh, on her pelvis from her changed exercise program. And you'll see the abnormal marrow on the MR. You'll see the cortical fracture line on the CT. Sometimes if there's minimal fracture line displacement and there hasn't been much reactive new bone formation to the fracture, then it may be very difficult to find these fractures on the CT scan. MR also establishes the age of fracture seen on the plain film, so this is another good reason to get MR, in, at least in certain circumstances. Here you have a 85-year-old um, white female. She had pain uh, over a four-day period, which had continued. She was known to have uh, fractures uh, or uh, demineralization, and her plain film shows lots of fractures. We don't have any prior studies. So how do you determine which of those is new and which of those is old? Um, here with the T1 weighted MR, you can again appreciate multiple fractures at multiple levels. Image 108 shows an arrow on what appears to be the most significant single level of new abnormality. Here's a T2-weighted image, and that shows you at the arrow or the, or at the level where the arrow is here on slide 110, shows you the single level, which shows abnormal increase signal on the stir image. So the MR, uh, using information available from all the imaging sequences and putting that together, has shown you the, the, the location of the patient's new fracture. Um, so, in summary, key concept number two, MR has really supplanted other methods of imaging for back pain. Uh, it's, most more, it's both more sensitive and more specific than other alternative means of imaging. It's got a very high predictive, negative predictive, predictive value rate for medically serious processes. In other words, if you get an MR on somebody and it's normal or, or does not show tumor, fracture, or infection, the chances of that at that point of, those, of the patient having tumor, fracture, or infection is very low. Um, so, it's, uh, so basically, it's, it's, a, it's a good test to kind of figure all that out. Now, key concept number three, uh, injections, uh, diagnostic and therapeutic injections of the spine often provide some benefit. Now, these injections have been around for decades, but they continue to be, uh, uh, they continue to undergo evolution and they're probably becoming more widely used rather than less widely used. 
Uh, diagnostic injections include nerve blocks, discography, facet injections, including intraarticular injections and what are called median branch blocks, and sacroiliac joint injections. Therapeutic injections can follow any of the diagnostic injections, or you might just inject into the epidural space for therapy. Uh, for therapy. Note that injection of the hip and shoulder may also further delineate pain and differentiate pain emanating from these joints in the spine. So a lot of different injections can be done. Uh, now, why do you use injections and what are the injections? Well, one thing to remember is that injections may localize or treat a so-called pain generator. Uh, they can localize and treat, for example, radicular pain. At each level of the spine, there's two nerves that come, two nerve roots that come together at the level of the dorsal root ganglion in or at the lateral aspect of the neural foramen, and then they form a spinal segmental nerve. The spinal segmental nerve carries with it a short sleeve connecting to the epidural space, and that uh, uh, sleeve is uh, what uh, the spine surgeon and researcher Leon Wolzi termed a circumneural sheath. Uh, the arrow to the image uh, here on uh, slide 117 points to the L4 circumnormal sheath as it exits under the L4 pedicle. Now, depending on the amount of contrast material and or how much medicine you inject, the material may seep back into the epidural space and cover other levels. For this reason, if you're going to perform a nerve block for diagnostic purposes, it's usually necessary to limit the volume of the injection material. Uh, it'll usually consist of only 0.1 to 0.2 ml of a non-ionic contrast to establish that the needle's in the appropriate position, and then you usually inject about 0.3 up to maybe 0.5 ml of 2% lidocaine. If the patient has the typical pain upon placement of the needle and during the injection, and then has excellent pain relief shortly thereafter, that constitutes a positive test. Um, incidentally, at least in my experience, if someone has a lot of pain with needle positioning, uh, next to a nerve, that nerve is typically inflamed. Most people don't have a tremendous amount of pain by simply putting the needle close to the nerve unless you're doing an awful lot of manipulation. Uh, now, sacroiliac joint injections, these can be used to localize and treat sacroiliac joint pain. The sacroiliac joint's kind of been in and out of favor as a cause of low back and hip pain for about 100 years or so. Uh, since very few surgeons advocate intervention, regardless of the results of the injection, uh, most people don't fuse or do much with the sacroiliac joint. There doesn't seem to be much of a diagnostic role for injections, although they might uh, provide you with a certain amount of satisfaction in, a, in being able to offer a specific diagnosis. Uh, because of the placebo effect and regression to the mean and the intermittent, intermittent natural history of back pain, it's often, to be, uh, often difficult to be certain the relief of pain with injection is genuine proof that that structure is causing the pain. Uh, now, with respect to discography, uh, discography is a diagnostic injection and the point to discography is that it diagnosis internal disc disrangement, de derangement. Uh, discography remains probably the most controversial diagnostic injection done. And indeed, it's probably one of the most controversial diagnostic maneuvers in medicine today. There are a number of reasons for this, and they include that uh, the disease that you're trying to di di diagnose, uh, so-called internal disc derangement, is very controversial in and of itself, and it doesn't have any widely accepted reference standard for diagnosis. You add to that the cost and the risk and the pain of discography, and the fact that researchers continue to debate the role that uh, of the false positive diagnosis, or even whether injections may cause permanent uh, worsening back pain, and you can understand why discography remains so controversial. I'm not going to talk much more about it here. Um, epidural injections can be used to treat back and leg pain. Uh, so here's a pretty much strictly treating injection. Now, epidural injections, unlike discography, are much less controversial. They've been around for you know, 50 years at least, and there's multiple controlled, randomized, and blinded studies that show efficacy of steroids over a placebo. Uh, while many patients tend to be frightened of the injections because of spine and you know, just don't go together in the same sentence for a lot of patients, the fact that the in is that when they're properly performed, they will take about five minutes and they'll be about as painful as having blood drawn or IV started. Um, 
It should be noted that uh, it's, it's, you know, at this point in time, I think it should be standard procedure to perform these with fluoroscopic guidance and the benefit of non-ionic positive contrast to document needle tip position and contrast flow. Um, research, published research has shown that up to about 30% of injections done without fluoroscopic guidance and contrast are incorrectly placed. Uh, that probably improves somewhat with uh, experience on the part of the injector, but uh, it's difficult to get that number down below 10 or 15 percent. So in that case, if somebody has an epidural, it's not done under fluoroscopic guidance and it doesn't work, you don't really know how to, you know, uh, analyze that information. I mean, the patient may not have gotten uh, an appropriate injection. Now, uh, lumbar interlaminar injections will cover cover several levels. The simplest and typically the least painful epidural injection to perform is an interlaminar lumbar injection. Uh, in this procedure, you put the needle between the lamina of the adjacent vertebra, and the contrast material will typically flow both superiorly and inferiorly for several levels. Uh, typically, the material also passes on both sides of the midline, um, although it usually will favor the side that you come in from. Uh, I usually come in from the side because it's a lot less painful for the patient if you don't go through the uh, interspinous ligaments. Rarely patients will have dividing so-called plica mediana dorsalis and it will keep the injection on one or the other side of the spinal canal. Uh, in general, the older the patient, the less likely the material will flow real well from one point in the injection to the other. And, and on the other hand, young people, it flows all over the place. Now. Um, as far as these injections go, <clears throat> excuse me, the frequency that these injections are performed kind of varies. Some advocate weekly or even daily injections up to a total of three or more. Others use a single injection. Uh, one reasonable way to go about this is to see the patient back a week after you injected them. And if, it, if, you, if the pain's continued um, and if the patient's willing to undergo an additional injection, uh, you, you can either look at it by saying, well, if you've got partial pain relief, we'll put more steroids back at the same spot. If you've got no pain relief, we'll try something else, you know, substitute an epidural or a nerve, or I'm sorry, facet or nerve block instead of an epidural. Um, and if you've got no pain relief, uh, if you've got complete pain relief, then you really wouldn't need to do another injection. Um, so, but, but, you know, locations vary as to how they treat that. Now, lumbar transferaminal injections can target a specific nerve instead of flowing all the way up and down the canal. Um, and if this injection looks like that nerve block we described before, there's a good reason for that. Basically, it's the same injection. You put the needle under the uh, pedicle and you inject a little bit of contrast material to make sure you're in the circumneural sheath, and then you put in uh, additional medicine. Now, since you're not really looking for a specific diagnosis with a transferaminal epidural injection, you can blow as much material in there as you want to, and usually you use two or even three cc's of uh, steroid and two or three cc's of uh, numbing medicine um, into the epidural space. I mean, far greater volumes than you use for a diagnostic uh, block. Uh, but the whole idea is you're trying to provide long-term pain relief. So uh, the other thing about the, these injections is that there are areas in the spinal canal which may be difficult to reach by a posterior approach. If you go under the uh, pedicle and on the anterior part of the uh, spinal canal, you, you can get some more material anteriorly, and you can also get it specifically along one nerve, usually further out than you can with an uh, uh, interlaminar epidural injection. Now, what about cervical spine injections? And again, I kind of promised that I would talk a little bit about cervical spine injections. Uh, um, most of the stuff I've said about the back can apply to the cervical spine as well. But there's a couple of words of caution, uh, one of which is if you're looking to make, uh, or if, you, if you're looking to do cervical injections, you, you, there are a lot of people that really want to be sedated or, 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 or under general sedation or heavily sedated for their spinal injection. And, you know, while that's understandable and while people are anxious about injections, it is uh, good to note that uh, some of the worst disasters that have occurred in cervical injections are, are in patients who were snowed with anesthesia, couldn't respond, and then had their cord injected, which could result in permanent neurologic damage. So that's a disaster that can be avoided if you can do the injection without significant general anesthesia 
or sedation. Another thing that can happen is that it, it, most of the time, you know, you do epidural injections from posteriorly in the cervical spine. If you're trying to do a transframmal injection in the cervical region, uh, it's very important to note that there are little un, unnamed feeding arteries that can go through the foramen and go back into the spinal cord, and it's almost impossible or, or just frame, plain frankly impossible to see those teeny little arteries um, without uh, magnification and subtraction and, and very careful technique. The upshot of that is you can have your needle ideally positioned in the neural foramen, you can inject a small amount of contrast and it looks okay, then you can inject a steroid and a steroid will follow that artery into the spinal cord and create permanent neurologic damage again. And that's been reported in several cases. So as a consequence of that, I don't really inject steroid by a transferamble approach. It's, it's just hard to believe that that's a safe thing to do. Uh, particularly considering that the yield of doing that is, you know, not that much better than doing it, if at all better than doing it from behind. So, uh, so that's the deal with the cervical spine injections. Now, facet joint procedures, they, they diagnose and treat posterior element abnormalities. Um, as I noted earlier, uh, the three-point joint comprises each level with the intervertebral disc in the front and the facet joints in the back. While the intervertebral disc has gotten most of the attention in caring for patients with back pain, at least for the last 70 years, some estimates, uh, some estimates that uh, are that facet joint processes can cause pain in at least 15% of patients. 15% may not sound like a large number, but you multiply that by the number of people that have backache, and you realize that there's probably millions of patients in the U.S. with facet joint abnormalities causing their back pain. So there's a lot of patients out there with facet joint abnormalities. Now with other in, uh, injections, um, it's reasonable to inject the facet joints to diagnose whether the cause of the pain, whether the cause of the pain, and also uh, to try to treat the pain. Um, facet joint injection can localize or treat the pain. Experts have developed techniques to enter the facet joint. In this illustration, the needle's pointing to the facet joint uh, at the L5S1 facet joint level, and you see contrast in the joint. The needle's been placed in the superior aspect of the joint. There's small structures, and the injection volume has to be limited in order not to just rupture the joint. If you put more than a couple of tenths of a cc in a facet joint, it usually just ruptures, and the rupture occurs into the epidural space, so you lose any diagnostic specificity. If you're just looking to treat the patient, that doesn't really matter, but if you're looking to make a diagnosis of facet joint abnormality, uh, or the facet joint has a specific cause of the patient's back pain, you have to have a very low injection volume. Um, an alternative uh, is to perform a rhizotomy. Uh, now, what are rhizotomies and, and what are medium branch blocks? Um, the anatomy here is that um, after leaving this neural foramen, uh, the uh, spinal segmental nerves divide into a ventral and a dorsal ramen, and the, and the dorsal ramus actually has some small branches uh, called the median branches, and they don't do much of uh, anything other than go to the facet joint. So they're very specific, and they always exist in a very specific location. And therefore, if you put the needles in that location and inject two-tenths or three-tenths of an ml of, of anesthetic, the idea is that you can basically anesthetize the joint by anesthetizing the nerve leading to the joint. This is kind of what dentists do when they're working on a tooth. They don't try to anesthetize a tooth. They try to anesthetize a nerve leading to the tooth. Now, if you do that and you diagnose pain coming from the facet joint by injecting local anesthetic and blocking the nerves to the facet joint and having the patient get better for a little while, then the idea is that if you can zap that nerve or perform a rhizotomy, you can actually get long-term pain relief. And indeed, there have been uh, randomized placebo-controlled trials where they put the needles in and didn't produce current to zap the nerves, or it actually fries a little piece of tissue about this big, including the nerve end. Uh, it, you, you can compare those patients that have had the active procedure versus needle placement alone, and you see a, a statistically significant improvement in patients with the active procedure. So it actually has improved work, so rhizotomy can help take care of patients. The other thing that uh, you saw that patient earlier with a synovial cyst, if you can get the needle into the facet joint itself in those patients with synovial proliferative disease and synovial cysts, it's compressing the nerves, 
And you can inject vigorously, usually a combination of a little bit of contrast material, but more specific, more, uh, more helpfully usually uh, anesthetic and steroid. If you can inject that vigorously into the joint, it can actually distend the joint, distend the cyst, rupture the cyst, and cure the patient's pain. Now, that may sound like kind of an ordeal to go through or a difficult process, but if you think about it, this is, there are going to be a significant number of patients with back pain and ridiculous symptom from, from synovial cysts. Their options are to either gut it out and take pain medication and hope that the cysts go away, and usually it does eventually, on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, they go to surgery. If they go to surgery, the surgeon is going to have to take down the facet joint and usually fuse that level because if you take off the facet joint, then you end up with an unstable level. So you have to take off the facet joint and fuse the spine at that level. That's a big procedure. So if you can, instead of doing uh, either of those two things, put a needle in the facet joint, inject vigorously, rupture the cyst, and solve the patient's problem in a five-minute procedure, uh, it can really be a, a benefit to the patient. So synovial cyst structures are something that's worthwhile to do. So that ends our tour of the spine. That's key concept number three. Injections can provide diagnostic and therapeutic benefit. So now I want to say one other thing about diagnostic and therapeutic injections, and that is uh, it seems like diagnostic and therapeutic injections should have kind of a time-limited effect because a steroid is, after all, a short, limited thing. Nonetheless, people seem to, at least some people seem to get a lot of prolonged benefit from uh, epidural steroid injections or other steroid injections. Why is that? There's probably two reasons, one of which is that back pain is an intermittent process with exacerbations and remissions. And if you treat during the exacerbation, then whether you did anything at that time or not, in two or three months or a few weeks, the patient will be back in remission. And if you just get rid of the pain during the worst part of it with the steroid injection, the patient's happy because they seem to be, you know, the, the effect of the injection seems to be longer than it actually is because you've taken the path past the exacerbation and the remission. So that's one reason why you can have long-acting pain relief from a steroid injection, longer than the physiologic effect of the, uh, of the injection. Another kind of interesting theory is that if you take a nerve, Proper nerve function relies on um, uh, vascular flow and nutrition into and out of the nerve. If you compress two ends of a nerve, even above the venous side of pressure, which is lower than the arterial side of pressure, if you compress them a little bit with two areas of spinal stenosis or a disc herniation here and some facet arthropathy here, whatever the reason is, you've got compression on two sides of the nerve. Because the way the nerves in the spine are supplied vascular from the vascular tree, most of the um, vascular supply comes in from the bottom and the top some distance away. So once you get compression at a couple of levels, you don't have any arterial inflow coming in or venous outflow coming out. The nerve gets irritated, annoyed, inflamed, and swells up, and it's a vicious cycle. You got a bad nerve, it's now swollen, it's getting worse because the nutrition's cut down, it can't get rid of the old blood, it can't get in the new blood, etc. So in these cases, if you inject steroid, you can kind of reverse that cycle by getting rid of the inflammation, making the nerve um, less swollen, and the nutrition can return to normal, and the patient may get long-term benefit from what is, uh, should be a short-term uh, product of the steroid. So there's a couple of reasons why people with steroid injections can get long-term benefit. Um, you know, I'm not saying that everybody with steroid injections gets long-term benefits. A lot of patients don't benefit much from steroid injection, but there are some theoretical reasons to believe that you can help people over the long haul with steroid injections. So, um, to review keeping current with back pain diagnosis uh, and treatment is going to be difficult, uh, but you want to provide the best care for your patients. My talk has been about the three key concepts to help you know what to order and when to order. Uh, the key concept number one, of course, was that red flags. Um, you know, personal history of malignancy, um, systemic features, weight loss, uh, fever, um, non-mechanical pain, um, and uh, onset of pediatric patient, these kind of things. All those red flags should alert you to the fact that you should be imaging sooner rather than later. Key concept number two, sure, plain films first, you know, to a certain extent that may help, but MR really has supplanted all your other imaging methods, and I've kind of gone through why that is. 
And then finally, diagnostic and therapeutic infection, injections may provide uh, some good uh, beneficial effect. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this lecture.